Good morning, welcome to Project 938. My name is Mark Lucenius and I'm the lead pastor for Project 938. And I wanna give a big shout out to those who've been new around Project 938. We've had live events the last couple uh, Sundays and it's been great to meet some of the folks who are new around here. But sometimes we don't know you're out there. So I'm gonna give you a couple ways you can uh, connect with us. First of all, if you're, on, if you're watching this through church online, you can log in to the chat. And you don't necessarily need to chat, we'd love to meet you in the chat, but just logging in will let us know that you're here and it gives us an opportunity to extend ourselves to you and let you know that we're available to answer any of your questions. Also, you can you can text uh, 938 connect to 97,000. And that gives you an opportunity just to let us know a little bit about you and or your family and hey, how we can be a part of your life. Uh, hey, next Sunday is a big Sunday for Project 938 on a number of levels. Uh, first, first of all, we're going to be in our new space for the first time. Now, we're calling it Showcase Sunday because we're hyping it up because, well, we're not so sure how it's gonna go because we're, gonna, we're just gonna be in there learning about our equipment, learning how to use the stuff, but we're gonna be doing it live and in the space. We want you to be there. We're gonna be worshiping at 10, but if you're gonna interested in a ministry team, you're gonna to wanna to show up at nine because each of the ministry teams are gonna have different huddles and you'll be able to learn about those ministries. Uh, also, next Sunday, we're gonna be consolidating and moving our nine and 11 o'clock church online services to 10 o'clock. And so uh, if you wanna you know, worship in this particular space at 9.30 online uh, and church online, you're gonna join us at 10. All right, now some of you are nine o'clock folks and that's just like the thing you wanna do and that's okay. You can join us at YouTube at nine o'clock or at any other time on demand to, to worship with us then. All right, so uh, that's next Sunday. We want you to be part of Showcase Sunday. We're so excited about our new space and make sure you know, 10 o'clock next Sunday at Church Online. 
A couple other things this past week, a summer road tour kicked off with the middle schoolers and high schoolers. Uh, they were at Sky Zone jumping on the trampoline. They got another event this week and they're gonna have an event every single week this summer. Speaking of summer, we, we are calling this the Summer of Acts, where we are studying the book of Acts and we are looking at the hope of the church and how the church uh, how God used the church to touch so many lives and really transform this world. We're looking at the early stories. And today we have a special guest speaker, Lou Smith, good friend of mine, good friend of our church. He's been a roadie captain. You're going to be really excited to hear him. He's actually going to be teaching one of my favorite passages. I'm kind of bummed I don't get to teach, but you're going to really enjoy this message. Speaking of messaging, as a part of our Summer of Acts, our Summer of Hope, we're calling, uh, we're calling all of us as a church to one specific challenge, one spiritual pre practice for the summer, to make new friends, okay? And we have uh, five principles for building friendship, uh, and it's in the acronym BLESS. Begin with prayer, listen, eat with others, serve others and share stories. Today, I wanna to encourage you to find somebody to eat with this week. Every single week, eat with somebody maybe you don't know or haven't seen before. Take the initiative to reach out and share a cup of coffee, invite somebody to your home or meet them at a restaurant. There's something that happens around a meal and our mutual dependence on food that brings people together. All right, well, hey, th that's what's going on around here. One other thing. It's Father's Day, and we're gonna have an all fathers uh, service. Uh, this this broadcast is all gonna be dads on this one, right? Uh, but uh, for Father's Day, um, I, I want to remind you uh, that just about for all the fathers that we know how how much you want to be a good dad, and even if your dad uh, wasn't what you wanted him to be just know that that's not necessarily what he wanted to be either. Regardless of whether your dad was awesome or whether he struggled, you have a heavenly father who lives in heaven. And so uh, I wanna pray for our fathers and I want to pray to our father for us. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those, even our fathers, who may have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now to all the dads who are trying real hard, we got a little blooper reel for you. Work it, Walter. Mm. <laughs> so I was cutting my grass uh, this past week and uh, I noticed that I had a little bit of a corrugated, what do you call this again? Be all in in every aspect of our lives, including, I know, to be all in. I missed the word to. To. T-O. It's so great to worship with you today. Um, <laughs> What's going on, 938? It's your friendly name. I have to pull up my pants. We're rolling. We're so good. <laughs> it's Graham here. I uh, I am excited. Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and <laughs> In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. What was that? This time, don't stink. Uh oh. Hello. Hi. Sorry if I'm in the way. Oh, no. Sorry. Next week, like Rachel mentioned in the beginning, not next week. Nothing's right. happening next week. You can do so online at 938give.net. I don't know what else to say. She was crawling along those empty walls. Uh, can I start that again? Anna, on the other hand, was crawling. <laughs> walls, those empty walls. 
that your life, that my life can change. I can change. <laughs> this <is> classic. <laughs> you, you're gonna be fine. We'll get this. It's no big deal. This is actually kind of funny. Start over. Get back on your horse. Get back on the wagon. Reset. Do over. Wash, rinse, repeat. Take a mulligan. Whatever you call it, there's no better time than now to begin again. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Lucinius, and I'm the lead. Pa Wait a minute. Guys, I, I'm not Mark Lucinius. I'm, I'm not nearly that tall. No, no, his entire family is taller than me. I wish I was that tall. Okay, fine. Can, can, can I do this again? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is actually Lou Smith, and I am so happy to be here with you this morning. You know, as I was preparing for this message today on Father's Day, and by the way, happy Father's Day to all of the dads out there. I really, truly hope you have a great day. But as I was preparing, I thought of my grandfather. My grandfather was a really cool guy that I only knew for a short period of time. And when he was younger, he actually grew up on a farm. He actually never made it past the fourth grade. At that point, it was customary for families to bring their family, kids especially, back to the farm to work at that time. And for my grandfather, he translated those skills, even though later in his life he became a full-time fireman for 31 years, into what he did in his yard. See, every time I went over to my grandparents' house, I always marveled at the yard because my grandfather's bushes always looked great. The grass was always green as anything, but it was his vegetable garden that caught my eye more than anything else. See, my grandfather, every year before he would plant his plants, would hand till the dirt. And it was a huge garden, so this was not a small feat. So after my grandfather passed away in 1983, my grandmother turned to my dad and said, uh, there's no way either one of us is going to hand till this garden. So my dad went to Montgomery Ward, if you remember that store, and bought our family's first rototiller, a machine to help till the ground. We still have that tiller in our family to this day, and it actually lives in my shed now. Every five or six years, I have to pull that tiller out of the shed in order to make a new garden, till an old one, or whatever it might be. But when I do that, I'm always reminded of my grandfather and my dad and the fact that it's lasted generations. And I always feel as if I'm helping the tiller remember what its purpose is and why it's here. I do that with new gas, changing the oil, maybe spraying a little starter fluid inside the carburetor before I pull the cord to get that baby rolling, but it always fires up and it sputters a little bit as if it's remembering what it needs to do as it begins to work again. See, we're in week three of a series that we're calling Begin Again. And for the last 15 months of our lives, things have been very different. And as we look to move more back into society and back in fellowship with one another face to face, it might not be so easy for some of us. So we're taking a chance to go back through some of the stories in the book of Acts, written by Luke, my favorite author in the New Testament, who wrote the gospel according to Luke and Acts, which equate to about 26 or 7% of the New Testament. And Luke tells us the story of the early church. So as we begin again today, we're actually going to take a hard look at the early church. So as a quick reminder, Mark last week talked about Pentecost. Pentecost had just happened. The Holy Spirit has come. Peter gave his sermon and 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ, which was absolutely amazing. And that leads us in to verses 42 through 47, where Luke says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is an early blueprint of the church when it started. But before I go there, in 1842, a couple of centuries later, a gentleman by the name of John Herschel really changed the game in the architecture and engineering industry. See, at that point in time, the plans that were made for these buildings had to be hand-drawn to start. As changes were made in the projects, well, they had to hand-draw the changes. Imagine what it was like to make multiple copies by hand. The draftsman, it would take hours to create these plans. But John Herschel figured out a mixture of chemicals, a photosensitive mixture, that when it was applied to paper, the spots that had no drawing on it would turn blue, and the spots that had the lines would stay white. It took a tenth of the time to create a blueprint as it did by hand. That was a huge game changer for the industry. But the really interesting thing about those blueprints is, even though those buildings have lasted generations, they still go back to the blueprints that are made in order to build those buildings as a way to reconfirm and remind themselves how the foundation was laid and how each floor was placed one on top of another. And that's what we're gonna do today as we look at verses 40, 42 through 47. This is an early church blueprint that Luke shares with us. So as we go, <clears throat> excuse me, as we go through this blueprint today, there's three key points that we're going to get into. But before we go there, when I say the word church to you, what does that mean? Many people define church as a place. It's a physical building that I go to. I go to church every week or maybe multiple times a week. <laughs> Not so much over the last year, but we're on our way there. Some people define church as an event. It's an event that happens every Sunday and I'm an attendee. I go every Sunday. And some people might define church as an organization. It's an organization that I belong to. These are pretty common definitions. But if we go back to the gospel according to Matthew in chapter 16, verse 18, he captures the words of Jesus who says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right here, Jesus is giving us our first picture and glimpse into the church that he envisions for the future. And if you go back to the original Greek translation, church is translated from the word ekklesia. Ekklesia is made of two words, well, two parts, I should say. Kaleo, which means to call, and the prefix ek, which means out. So it means those who have been called out. And in the sense that we have here, it emphasizes a group of people who've been called out together for a special purpose. So ecclesia or church is a group of people called out for a special purpose. The Apostle Paul later in his letter to the church to the, uh, in Ephesus added a little bit to this definition, which I love, and that is he says that the church is his body or Jesus' body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the church is a gathering of people called out for a special purpose as an extension of Christ in this world. But when I say the word church, how does that make you feel? Some people have very positive feelings when they hear the word church. Maybe you grew up in a church that was growing and multiplying in your region and you just have great memories of that. Maybe you led a small group and you have relationships and friendships with folks that have lasted a lifetime. That's fantastic. But if I had to guess, most of you might not have such a positive feeling when you hear the word church. I know I had a situation in my life where I didn't really have a good experience with church. And over the course of the last year, I've had multiple conversations with people who expressed those same challenges that they experienced. Church for them felt more like an exclusive group that you had to have certain knowledge and understanding to participate within rather than an inclusive, welcoming environment like they envisioned that it would be. So in moments like these, it's really important for us to go back and look at this blueprint that Luke gives us. And I mentioned earlier, there's three key points, three key blueprint aspects that we're gonna go through this morning. 
And the first is devotion, quite simply. Luke writes, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, some translations say they gave themselves, and that's really the true essence of what we're talking about here with devotion. It's a real true giving completely of oneself to these items that Luke is talking about. And there are four specific items that he mentions, the first of which are the teachings, the apostles' teachings to be specific. Why doesn't it say Jesus' teachings? So there's a couple of things to remember here. In the first century, there was no bookstore that anyone could go to to buy a New Testament copy because the whole New Testament had not been printed yet. They couldn't grab an app on their phone and pick it up and read the New Testament. It just wasn't possible. But the other thing to remember is the apostles were there when Jesus was teaching. So for the apostles' words to be heard, it was as close as they could come to hearing the words of Jesus. And it wasn't just the words that they heard people or heard Jesus share with the people. It was the words that Jesus shared directly with them. So the apostles' teaching carried immense weight. If you go back to the beginning of chapter 2 in Acts, which Mark talked about last week, where you see Peter giving his sermon or his teaching to the people, 3,000 people were saved as a result of that teaching. There's a lot of power behind the apostles' words at that point in time. So as a group of people called out for a special purpose as an extension of Christ in this world, those believers, those early believers, were truly devoted and gave themselves to the teachings of the apostles. But do you feel like you're devoted to the teachings of Jesus? Do you interact with God's word on a daily basis? And if you don't, I understand. That's okay. What I'll say is, and Mark talked about this earlier, there's a summer reading plan that's out there as we work our way through the book of Acts this summer, and I would urge you to engage with it. Small bite-sized chunks, not huge mounds of chapters to read at once. I would urge you, encourage you to, to spend that time in the Word. The second item that Luke calls out here is fellowship. And I have to tell you, this is one of these churchy words that I only ever hear in church. I, I, I don't know why I do, but, you know, it's not like I'm going to say, you know, hey, Walter, you want to go have some fellowship on Friday? That, that's not going to happen. Or, you know, hey, Mark, that fellowship last night was crazy. No, <laughs> we don't say these things. When I think of fellowship, I think of the fellowship hall in my childhood church, which was anything but welcoming from a fellowship perspective. <laughs> That fellowship hall was the smelliest, mustiest, dirtiest, looked like a gymnasium room in the building that you could find. It was in the basement. No one ever went there because it took a thousand steps to get down to that room. And when they were, it was just because there was an event that was planned. No one ever went down there. But fellowship was a critical aspect of the early church. And if you look up the definition of fellowship in a dictionary, you'll find a definition along the lines of this. It's a friendly association, especially with people who share one's interests. Great. You know, throughout scripture, God reminds us how we're meant to be in relationship with one another. And if you go to the Greek translation of the word fellowship, it's the word koinonia. Koinonia is derived from the Greek word koinos, which means common. So koinonia means a having in common. They had a lot in common with each other. And actually Luke says all. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Now at the root of that, the main thing that they had in common was their belief in Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and the ascension to heaven which had just occurred. But let me ask you this. Are you in fellowship with other Christians right now? That's been tough over the last year. Better yet, are you in a small group? I've said this countless times over the last year, and I will continue to say it. It is great to get together and worship with each other on Sundays, whether it's virtually online like today or in person. But the real work as a Christian in relationship with God and in fellowship with one another is done Monday through Saturday. And that's where small groups really play a huge part in our lives. So if you haven't joined a small group, my encouragement to you today is to reach out to the team and find out what small groups are available and when they're going to be starting so that you can jump into one. Now, the 
third point that Luke brings up is the breaking of the bread. They were devoted to the breaking of the bread. And scholars like to debate this one over history they have. Is Luke talking about a celebration of the Lord's Supper, breaking of the bread? Or is he just talking about people having dinner together? I always think of Italian families when I hear, let's break bread. Which one is he talking about? Well, most scholars say it's a celebration of the Lord's Supper. And based on my personal study, I totally agree with that. And it's always good to take a step back and remind ourselves and breathe and pause for a moment what Jesus has done for us and to celebrate that through the breaking of the bread. And the fourth item that Luke mentions from a devotion perspective is prayer. They were devoted to prayer. Incredibly important. This is how the early believers built their relationship with God. And for us today, it is the number one way that we communicate with God. You know, I can't imagine uh, how my relationship with my wife would be if I only had a conversation with her once a day or every three days or maybe once a week. So prayer is super important in our relationship with God. And these early Christians, these early believers were doing it. They were devoted. They were giving themselves completely to it so that they could build that relationship. But the one thing about their prayers, and this is a theme that you'll see as we continue through the book of Acts this summer, there's a lot of prayer there. It's not just prayer for themselves, it's prayer for others. And this leads us into the second key blueprint point for today of the early church, and that is commitment to a loving community. Luke wrote, And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with good and generous hearts. Miraculous stories were happening. And all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, this type of change in healing, these miracles that were occurring, were happening at the hands of Jesus, but he's ascended to heaven now. It's still happening with the apostles. And we know this if we fast forward to chapter 3, and we see Peter and John, they're approaching the temple gate, and there's a lame man sitting right in front of the gate. And they walk up to him and they say, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand, by the right hand, and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened. Here in 2021, it's easy for us to think that maybe those types of miracles were just happening during biblical times. The apostles, Jesus, they were the only ones that made those types of miracles happen. But I'm here to tell you today that those miracles still happen today. And I'll give you two great examples. Number one, Years ago, my mother beat breast cancer. That is a miracle. Only God can do something like that. And my second one, a great friend of mine, had a massive injury and was told that he would never walk again and he would never drive a car again. Ladies and gentlemen, he does both of those every single day. And only God can do something like that. So miracles can and do happen. Sometimes I think we just need to pause and reflect on what's going on in our lives. And I would urge you to do that. Recognize those miracles that are happening, both small and large, and thank God for each one. But in the midst of these miracles, the early believers in this church were forming a loving community. They were taking all of the things that they had and selling them to help other people. Luke states they distributed the proceeds to all. And if you look at the word all, it's emphasized four times in this passage. But they weren't just giving these things to or this help to other Christians. See now, selling things or collecting money and helping others was not an uncommon thing at this time. 
It's historically documented that the Jewish community at this point made a collection and they would distribute those funds out to people that were in need within their Jewish community. But the Christians got a little radical with this. They were helping people outside of the community. And I can only imagine how attractive that was to people outside of the community. We know it was a very diverse community that they were engaging with and that was coming to Christ as a result. Just by reading through the book of Acts, we'll see more of that. But it was this love that they were spreading. When someone was in need, they would help. My point here is their concern was for the greater good of the community and not for themselves. The early church embraced the message that Jesus shared when he said, I came to serve and not to be served. And that was at the heart of how they lived in their community. So when it comes to helping your community, do you? You know, I was reflecting on this and it brought me back to the core values of 938, to build community, ex- or strengthen faith, and extend compassion. And these are three core characteristics in this blueprint. This is what Luke is talking about. And that's why 938, you're making a massive difference in the Westchester region right now. Luke wrote, all who believed were together and had all things in common. That means this can't happen without you. You are a key ingredient to extending this type of compassion into the community and building that loving community here. And speaking of sharing, this leads us into our third and final point for today, out of our early church blueprint, and that is sharing the gospel. Luke states, And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. So how does someone come to believe in Jesus? Better yet, if you're a believer, how did you come to believe in Jesus? So there's this this saying, and there's a lot of controversy tied to it, and I'm not going to get into it, but I love the saying. And you may have heard it. It says, preach at all times, use words when necessary. When I think of that, I think of when I walk in the house at the end of the day, and I smell something appetizing. I know something's being made in the kitchen by the smell. I'm attracted to it right away. And I run into the kitchen to find my wife, and I ask her, what are you making? but what would happen if she just didn't answer me? I'd fumble around in the kitchen trying to find whatever it is that she's making, and most likely I'd never know what it was. But when she tells me that she's baking cookies, immediately I'm devoted to eating those cookies as soon as they come out of the oven. But the point is, she has to share that story with me in order for me to know what it is that she's doing. So I would alter this statement to say, preach at all times, But when the opportunity presents itself, use words. In order to know Jesus, someone has to be drawn to hear a story of Jesus. And this community, this early church community, was so attractive in the way that they were reaching out into the community and sharing with others that people were coming to them and they were sharing their stories. And we know this because Luke says, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. They were sharing their stories, the story of Jesus. Heck, go back to chapter 2 again when Peter was giving his sermon, his message, his teaching. 3,000 people from one story. That's amazing. And that's just a small example of the explosion that Christianity had in the first three centuries. But it's the power of the story that's the key here. Back in the the first chapter of Acts, Luke captured something very critical that Jesus stated. He said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is the quintessential passage as it relates to evangelism, sharing your faith, sharing the gospel. So have you shared your faith with others? Are you comfortable sharing your faith with others? And if you've answered yes to both of those, that's awesome. Put the pedal to the metal and keep going. That is exactly how this church is going to multiply. But I'm going to venture to guess that most of you have answered no to those questions. And I will tell you for a long period of time, 
I answered no to those questions. You're not alone, and I understand how it feels to not be comfortable to share your faith. But my encouragement to you is an encouragement that was shared with me by someone who I love to death, and that encouragement was, your story has immense power because your story is uniquely yours and your unique story is one that people can relate to. When they hear that story, you have a chance of helping them. There's, there's this statement that he also said to me, and it was, when you share your story, you cannot fail. Now, in one of my seminary classes, there's a book that I read, and I am not promoting it, by the way, and it is called Share Jesus Without Fear. It was written by a gentleman named William Fay. And in this book, William says, Non-believers must hear the gospel an average of 7.6 times before they receive it. So if anyone walks away from you when you share the gospel with them, remember, the word of God never returns void. Maybe the person you shared with has never heard it before. Maybe this is only the second time he has ever heard it. Or maybe this is the 6.6th time. The point is, sharing your story is one step in their journey to faith. You can't fail. Now, you might not see a result right away. You know, I have a, a really good friend who I've known for a long time. He does not believe in Jesus. When he had heard that I had been baptized and that I had given my life to Christ, we got together for dinner. And during that dinner, he said to me, I guess this will be our last dinner together. I said, dude, what are you talking about? He said, well, Lou, I'm quite literally the definition of a heathen. And I said to him, I said, I'm pretty sure you're exactly who I need to be having dinner with. <laughs> now, I've shared my story with him, and I've invited him to church multiple times. We just haven't hit the 7.6th time yet. And that's why your story matters. You never know which one it will be. So my challenge to you today is this. You know, in this summer where we're trying to find and, and make new friends, part of that is sharing your story. And I would urge you to find one person, one person, share your story with the full confidence that it cannot fail. It's not possible. You know, as we close up, the, the one thing that I want to remind us all of is the greatest devotion, the greatest giving of oneself that has ever occurred is when Jesus went to the cross to die for your sins so that you could have a right relationship with God. When I reflect on Jesus' life, everything that he said and did mirrors this blueprint. He was intensely devoted to everything that Luke mentioned and really promoted that to everyone that he was with. Every word out of his mouth told his story of salvation, and it shared the gospel message as it was growing. And the community that followed him, it was one of the most loving communities there. And the best part about it was, it was inclusive. It was welcome to everyone. It was not exclusive. There were no requirements just to believe. When I think about this blueprint further, I think about some of the churches that I've had the ability to be involved with over the last years. Some of you may remember uh, Matt Silver and Carrie Silver. They were with us for a short period of time as they were getting ready to launch Experience Christian Church in Exton. And when I had initial conversations with Matt as he was planning things, it was this blueprint that Luke shares that was at the heart of what they were doing. And they're doing a fantastic job right now. Two Sundays before the Pennsylvania lockdown happened last year, I attended my first service at the Discover Church, which at that time was meeting at Lower Marion High School. And my now friends, Mark and Monica Poland, well, when they were planting, this was the exact blueprint that they followed. And in the meetings that we have every other week as we plan to relaunch at the end of this summer, this is at our core, devoting ourselves to the teachings, to prayer, to uh, breaking of the bread, to fellowship specifically, but more than that, really trying to build a loving community and sharing the gospel any chance that we have. But you don't have to look any further than Project 938. Because I remember 
when Mark was getting ready to plant. And I had a lot of conversation with him. And this was the blueprint. You know, Mark and the team planted the seed, but it was you, the 938 community, that did all of the work to get to this point. You know, 938 hasn't just survived over this last year. It has really blossomed. And I truly look forward to the future and what God has to bring here. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, thank you for the writings of Luke. Thank you for this blueprint that he has shared with us. And God, as we start to begin again as a church and as we plan to get back together in person on a weekly basis, God, would you remind each one of us of these key aspects as a church, that you would give us the heart of devotion, that you would give us the love and the strength needed to build a strong community in the Westchester region and beyond. And God, would you also give us the courage and Holy Spirit, give us the words as we share our story with others. You know, Mark has always said, anything healthy will grow and multiply. And God, following this blueprint, I firmly believe that it will here as well. We praise you and love you and glorify you. Happy Father's Day. And I'll pray all of this in Jesus' great name. Amen.
938. I'm super proud of you. Uh, Lou called us to be a loving community. And as I think about that song, God So Loved the World, I, I think of us as the kind of people who just continues to welcome. Uh, I know some of your stories and I know some of your friends' stories and, and I just believe we are the kind of people that have experienced grace and can extend it. it. It plays itself out in our stories, it plays itself out in the grace we're able to extend because that which we received. Uh, and that's why I love this church. I've been bragging about you all week. Uh, I hope this message reminded you of who, who you want us to be and but more importantly who god wants us to be a uh, big reminder next sunday be with us at the Nower uptown performing arts center for showcase sunday and, and let's see let's try this thing out let's make it happen together uh, if you can't be with us, join us at 10 o'clock at 9.38 online. Uh, one of the things that uh, Lou talked about was devotion. And I want to say big thanks to our givers who have consistently showed their devotion in giving. And so uh, thanks to some of the folks who started giving, uh, some of the folks who have become recurring givers. Uh, and if you're ready to take a next step, we're, we're looking to move forward as a church and we're going to need all of us on board. So a hey, big thanks to those who have stepped up uh, already and those who are getting ready to step up next. Uh, you can do that by uh, texting 938 GIVE to 97000 or just going to our website and finding your way. We thank you so much for all the ways that you give, your time, your love, your care, your prayer, all these things to make us a church that helps people find their way back to God.